Grace Believers Bible Study, and thank you for watching this morning. Will you turn in your Bible with me to Romans chapter 8? I appreciate you watching every Sunday, and I hope it's a blessing to you. We're studying prayer. We've been discussing prayer dispensationally considered, and I want you to think about uh, the things that we've gone over in the past. The fact is that Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I've tried to bring out the fact that <clears throat> all of the verses in the Bible concerning prayer are not directly to us. Now, in most cases, we can find some spiritual application to these verses, as in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Hebrews through Revelation or whatever. So all the Bible is for our admonition and learning, but all the Bible is not written directly to us. And as I've mentioned before, if there is a promise between Romans and Philemon, including in Paul's epistles now, if there is a promise in there, you can claim that promise by faith. You can live by that promise. And if God Almighty told you in Romans through Philemon that uh, he'd answer certain prayers for you based upon your asking in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can ask in Jesus Christ's name and be assured that God will answer you. But of course, uh, John chapter 14 and such passages as John 14 are taken out of their context <clears throat> and used to satisfy the individual's desires. Jesus said to the apostles, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And there have been thousands of people that tried to claim the passage out of John chapter 14 and end up with heartache and pain. The reason they could do that had to do with the fact that Jesus Christ had told them, he told Peter, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. How is that? He said, as John baptized with water, you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And in Acts chapter 2, Jesus Christ went up to heaven, having told them, now he told them in Acts chapter 1, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me. <clears throat> Jesus Christ went up, and according to Acts chapter 2, received from God the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, and Jesus Christ baptized the twelve with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. And so they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were led by and filled with the Holy Spirit to such an extent that that which they bound on earth was bound in heaven. That which they loosed on earth was loosed in heaven. Therefore, whatsoever they asked the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father did. And I don't believe for one second that he's saying, if you say that you're asking in my name, I'll do it. I don't believe that. It happens all the time. We are habited to doing that. We say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm asking this. And that's not what he's saying. In other words, if you're in Christ, if you're in his name, if you're, in other words, if that's your position, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, in John chapter 17, he said, as I'm in thee, the Father, so are these in me, and on and on he goes. And he said in John chapter 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. <clears throat> And so uh, they prayed in his name. And God did what they asked. Now, in Romans chapter 8, notice in verse 26. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, we are not sure what to pray for. We're not positive about the circumstances that surround us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we look not on the things which are seen. Those things which are seen are temporal. We look on the things which are not seen, the things which are eternal. And so when all these things are happening around us, we just believe Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Look at the verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Please observe what his purpose is, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, 
he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. If God Almighty saved you by his grace, then he predestinated that he's going to conform you to the image of his Son. And all the things that happen to us day in and day out, we look not upon them as if they're eternal or some th such thing. We know they're but for a moment. God said they are. And so we know that they work together for good. They don't feel good, but they work together for good in conforming us to the image of the Son of Almighty God. And God will never bring upon us more than we can bear. God's grace is sufficient for the believer. <clears throat> now, notice in verse 31. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In other words, we're blessed, as in Ephesians chapter 1, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. We don't have to ask God for his blessings upon us. Why? Ephesians chapter 1 says that he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. So we're in Christ and Christ is in us. Hold on the passage and turn to Colossians and look in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, and we'll just believe the Bible. No matter what we understand, let's believe in the book. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, reference to the saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, then Christ is in the saint and the saint is in Christ. Now, <clears throat> Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Savior, is at the right hand of the Father and we in Him. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible said, But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you're saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come on and on and on. All right, then we by the Holy Spirit are baptized into one body and this body is the body of Christ. Then we're in Christ. Now, when Jesus Christ died at Calvary, we were identified at Calvary in Christ. In other words, he took our place there. Therefore, we're identified in his death. We're identified in his burial, and we're identified in his resurrection. So we were quickened together with him. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Well then, we were crucified with Christ. We were identified in his crucifixion. So when Jesus Christ died, we that are believers died at that time. According to Romans chapter 6, we were buried with him. In Romans chapter 6, notice in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. There's not a drop of water in the passage. The passage compares with 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Bible said, By one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greek, on and on and on. All right, we know then that the baptism in the verse is not water, it's spiritual baptism. Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? In other words, if we by the Spirit have been placed in the body of Christ since we believed, then we can be assured we were baptized into his death. Just as we are identified in the body of Christ today by our testimony that we give, 
we were identified by the Holy Spirit in the death of Jesus Christ when he died at Calvary. Now, verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. The baptism is the baptism of death. And it matches Luke chapter 12, verse 50. In Luke 12, verse 50, the Bible said, Jesus himself said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. Well, Jesus had already been baptized in water. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had a baptism to be baptized with. That baptism that he was baptized with is the baptism of death. Jesus Christ was immersed in death. He was overwhelmed in death. And so as Jesus Christ hung upon the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He immersed himself. He went into death. We were baptized into his death. We were immersed in death along with Jesus Christ at Calvary. In verse 4, therefore we're buried with him, not were, are. You see, Jesus Christ, the physical human being that he was, according to the flesh, died at Calvary. The physical, the physical human being, flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible said. And so Jesus Christ's blood was shed at Calvary. Jesus Christ went into the tomb, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ became sin at Calvary. He became our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Well, then Jesus Christ at Calvary was what we are by nature and by action. Jesus Christ became sin for us that the body of the sins of the flesh might be destroyed. The body of Christ's flesh became sin for us and our sin was dealt with at Calvary and was buried at Calvary and the old man never rose. The, the resurrected Jesus Christ was not the body of the sins of our flesh. The body of the sins of our flesh were dealt with at Calvary. The wages of sin is death. They were put away with. They were judged. He was found guilty and God crucified him. God delivered him up for us all and so our sins were done away with by the death of Calvary. Jesus Christ went in the tomb and took our sins away and the, and the new man arose. The new man that we are in Christ Jesus arose from the dead. We were identified in his resurrection. We were quickened together with him. We were made alive together with him, ascended up with him, and are now seated at the right hand of the Father. So, the old man that we were is still buried. The old man that we were never resurrected. Jesus Christ became sin and died, but Jesus Christ did not resurrect as the sin that he died. Jesus Christ died for our sins, put away our sins, was judged for our sins, condemned for our sins, and then rose from the dead. And our old man was left behind. Now in the verse again. Verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, <clears throat> that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, People really get hung up on these verses. In verse 5, the likeness, they say that the likeness is a watery grave. The idea being that some individual places a handkerchief over your nose and then the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost lets you down in a watery grave. That's not the likeness of his death. What is the likeness a reference to? It's the type of death. It's not the position of his body in death. It's the type of death. The position of his body when he died was hanging upright with nails in his hands. 
It's the death of the cross, beloved. The likeness of his death has to do with the death of the cross. He died the death of the cross. We were planted together in the likeness of the death of the cross. We that believe in him as our Lord and Savior have been crucified with Christ. We were crucified at Calvary. We are conformed to his death. The idea is not that we're dying a little bit every day. The idea is that we are to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. We were planted together in the likeness of his death. What is the likeness? It's the death of the cross. The death of the cross is for criminals. We that were criminals died at Calvary. And we've been resurrected to walk in newness of life. Now, with that in mind, go back to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him? also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Jesus Christ not only died for your sins, Jesus Christ was buried because of your sins, but Jesus Christ arose from the dead identifying himself with you in resurrection. And Jesus Christ went up to the right hand of the Father and he's seated at the right hand of the Father today and he's interceding for us as we know not what to pray for as we ought. He intercedes for us. He searches our hearts and he knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And he that died for our sins was buried and rose again is talking to the Father in our behalf. And while we're groaning and travailing and whatever and don't know what to say, Jesus Christ knows exactly what to say about you and he knows exactly what to say for you and he knows what you need, when you need it, and how you need it. What's the idea then? Trust him. What's the idea? Believe in him. What's the idea? Put your confidence in him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct thy paths. You know, an individual goes out in the morning and tries to start his automobile. It won't start. And he works and frets and carries on there. Finally, he gets inside and he prays. And he expects God Almighty to start the thing. Of course, he does, all, he does that after having lifted the hood, looks around under the hood, don't know what he's looking at in the first place most times. And then in a fit of anger and rage, slams the hood down. Finally, it comes to him. He ought to pray about it. So he sits down in the car and he prays and expects, his God, expects God to start the car. But if God started the car, what this fellow sitting in there doesn't know that about the time he pulled out into the main highway out there, there's an 18-wheeler that's going to be coming by there doing about 75 miles an hour. And if he gets out there at the proper time, that 18-wheeler is going to hit him broadside and he's going to be dead. His goose is cooked. So what happens? He gets in there and he prays, Oh my God, please start my car. I'm going to be led to work. Oh God, please start. Then he's begging God, won't you please make this stupid car? And people say, Well, God doesn't answer every prayer. Well, of course he does. God doesn't. God's answer is no. If I started your car for you, you'd pull out there and that truck would hit you and you'd be dead. And I've still got some things for you to do. I've still got some work for you. And so you're to believe me. You're to trust me. You're to relax there and believe in me. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. 
But Brother Moore, are you telling me that we're not to pray? The Bible said you're to pray about everything. Where do you pray? The Bible said you're to pray everywhere. You're to pray about everything, you're to pray everywhere, and you're to pray believing. Believing what? That all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God Almighty knows far more than you do what you need, when you need it, and how you need it. And the Bible said, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now we've got on the board up here, prayer, warring, begging, or believing. We've been looking at that for two or three Sundays now. Is prayer warring? Well, we've already seen in the last couple of classes. You don't go to the war and go to war in prayer. It's not your duty to get through the principalities and powers to get to where God Almighty is. You're not to go warring and charging with the arm of God on and charging the devil and getting to the throne of grace. You have to think about something for a while. There are some people back there in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and whatever, that their salvation looks forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. So they believe here, looking forward to atonement at the second coming. But Paul said in Romans chapter 11 that we've already received the atonement. So we don't look forward to the second coming of Christ. We look back to atonement at Calvary. God atoned for the church with the body of Christ when Jesus Christ died for us. But Israel is looking forward unto atonement at the second coming. And their faith has to endure unto the end. They've got to endure unto the end to be saved. We don't have to endure anywhere or endure anything to be saved. We by faith trust Christ as our Lord and Savior, believing that he died for our sins, was buried and rose again. But Peter in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 had no idea that Jesus Christ had died for his sins. It never entered into his mind that Jesus had died for his sins. Jesus Christ never told Peter that he died for his sins. And so Peter is looking forward to something in the future. We look back to something that has already taken place. Now you know what? We're not looking to the Lamb of God. We're looking to the man, Christ. The man of Romans chapter 5. We're not sheep. We're not sheep in the pastor. We are members of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're members of his flesh, members of his bone. We're members of him by one spirit. We are baptized into one body. And when Jesus Christ died, we died. When Jesus Christ was buried, we were buried. When Jesus Christ was quickened, we were quickened. When Jesus Christ resurrected, we were re resurrected. When Jesus Christ ascended up, we were ascended up. When Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father, Father, we sat down at the right hand of the Father, and there we sit right now at the right hand of the Father in the throne room. We're not warring to get to God. Jesus Christ got to God for us. Warring, begging. A lot of people today are like beggars. You know, head bowed, chest beating individuals going to the altar and pleading with God, oh please God, I pray dear God that thou would do this and thou would do that and thinking that by their tears and their distorting their faces and carrying on that they're going to get through to God. Why, that's a form of unbelief. The Bible believer believes that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father and that Jesus Christ is interceding for him and he doesn't have to beat on his chest and agonize and twist his face and carry on. I see some of these Pentecostal preachers on television and they do their faces all out of shape and oh God and on and on. 
Maybe they ought to be awarded with some kind of Oscar or something, I don't know, for putting on a good act. But that's not the way you get to God. You get to God through Jesus Christ. How? By believing in Jesus Christ, by trusting Jesus Christ, putting your confidence in Him. We're not involved in sacrificial altar Baal worshiping. We're not Baal worshipers. We're members of the body of Christ. And so we just believe. Turn in your Bible, please, to 2 Corinthians. And look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you don't have a Bible, please write the reference down. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Notice in verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work in the Lord. Do you see what that said? God is able to make special favor abound toward you in order that you always will have all things that you need. If you need a job, God can give you favor with the proper people so you can get a job. If you need work, God can give you favor so you can get work. God is able to make special favor, make grace abound toward you in order that you'll have all sufficiency in all things. Turn please to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, and you must understand that the context of Philippians chapter 4 has to do with some people who gave up something for somebody else. In other words, they contributed to the ministry of the apostle Paul, and Paul, uh, and Paul says to them in verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Turn please to Matthew chapter 9. I notice what Jesus Christ said to these people here. In Matthew chapter 9, I notice in verse 29, Matthew 9, 29, Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, so be it unto you. According unto your faith, what do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus paid for your sins at Calvary, was buried and rose again? Do you believe he's at the right hand of the Father now? According to your faith, so be it unto you. All things do work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So what do you do then? You believe God and you pray without ceasing. You pray everywhere and you pray about everything and you give thanks for anything that you get. I thank you for listening today. Until next time, good day. Grace Believers Bible Study is sponsored by the Berean Bible Study Association of Pensacola, Florida and paid for by your free will offerings. Weekly classes are held at 111 Roslyn Way. The times are Sunday, 10 and 11 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. We also have an audio tape ministry whereby Bible study tapes are mailed bi-monthly to anyone requesting them. You can receive these Bible messages on tape by simply writing to us and request that your name be added to our mailing list. Our address is Berean Bible Study Association, 204 Tower Drive, Pensacola, Florida, 32514. We look forward to hearing from you.